The Lakota were a Great Plains tribe that were mostly nomads. They lived in northeastern Nebraska and hunt and traveled with the buffalo, and they lived in teepees. When they hunted, they used every part of the buffalo for everything they needed. When he was younger, Black Elk lived with his tribe up until he was about 24 years of age. The white buffalo calf woman is really the essence of where Lakota ceremony and those seven specific traditions came from. And you see, she came in from the plains. The people were looking for food. There were a couple of warriors out. They were going in different directions, looking for hunt because there was no food for them to eat. And they saw something coming in from the plains and it rolled and it was dust. And when it stood up, it was a woman dressed in white buckskin. And they were both appalled by what they saw. The one warrior had lustful thoughts about the woman because she was beautiful. The other warrior didn't. The warrior who had the lustful thoughts, all of a sudden, he kind of evaporated or incinerated under this cloud. They said that lightning hit him and there's other things that said happened and it covered him and he was gone. He was dust. The other man, of course, the other warrior was like, oh, gee. And she come up to him, she said, listen, I'm bringing you something. And so I want you to go back to the people and tell them to prepare for me. And she told them what to do to prepare for her visit. And sure enough, a day or so later, she goes to the village and the people were suffering. And they didn't have enough food and they didn't have the knowledge and understanding from the creator of what to do. So she gave them traditions, spiritual traditions to follow. And also she gave them a chanupa. A chanupa means a pipe, and that pipe is something that they could use to send their prayers to the Creator. That chanupa was a very sacred thing. During the late 1800s, the Lakota were having their land and culture taken from them. This was the society Black Oak was born into. When he was only nine years old, he had a vision that would lead him on the path to becoming a medicine man. He grew up in a traditional Lakota way. And um, he was nine years old when he had his great vision. Uh, at a young age, he understood that he was maybe a, um, a little bit different, but in, in a good way because the spirits were able to um, be with him. There was a multitude of um, spirits that came to him and showed him the other world and, and what it's like to um, to live in unity, and that's really the, the reason why they came to inform him about that other world, so that there could be more of that type of peace and unity on earth. That they're not what you call a medicine man. That's once again, that's the English translation for it. But people who, um, like you might say in Lakota, he's a uh, wichashawakan. Uh, He's a man who is of a very mysterious way. But there are different kinds of medicine. And there are different ways to approach this world and the people who live in it. And it's not always uh, in the way that you see black elk. My father was medicine. But his medicine was through the spoken word. He told stories. But he didn't sit down and say, what? He didn't sit down and say once upon a time there was this, that, and the other. It wasn't like that. I saw men who came out of the penitentiary and they would come for miles to come see my father. I saw people who come up from Mexico or this guy who he knew that used to work on the railroad. They'd come from all over and they'd sit with my dad just to have him doctor them with his words. And so the same story that he might have told me when I was a child or told my brother or somebody else, he would say, tell them that same story, but he would t tell it in a way that addressed this person's wrongdoings or this person's pain or this person's um, having been violated in some way. And that same story would have a whole different kind of medicine for that person. So what do medicine people do? They carry different kinds of medicine. In 1886, Black Elk joined Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. They traveled around America and Europe to perform. 
When Black Elk came back home from Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, the Lakota were very unhappy from the U.S. taking the land. The ghost dance movement started. From doing this, they hoped to bring back land and their way of life. The U.S. didn't like that, so they arrested Chief Sitting Bull and shot him. The U.S. attacked the Lakota at Wounded Knee and over 300 Sioux were killed. It's hard to know what, he was, what was going through his mind, um, but certainly everything was changing for his people and his way of life, completely changing. So um, certainly those feelings of uh, uncertainty, um, probably terror, truly, and um, how to cope with all these changes because uh, the way of, uh, the Lakota way of life was being severely threatened in a number of different ways. And um, so I think for him too, the understanding that, there, that he needed to work to save uh, that way of life. So I think there was probably a multitude of feelings um, which we can, which are kind of hinted at through the work of Black Elk Speaks and other works that Black Elk shared with people. It was the largest genocide in contemporary human history. There were, um, different counts vary, 25 to 250 million people that were here. At some point after the Wounded Knee Massacre, Black Elk converted to Catholicism. Black Elk uh, would have converted in, because he recognized the holiness in that way and those teachings as well as how um, he recognized the holiness in all way of life, in every way of life. So, of course, he could also recognize that. And he used um, that understanding to inform others about how to lead um, a good and um, holy life for themselves so they could actually have a greater understanding of um, the spirit as they were here on Earth. Black Elk met with author and poet John G. Nyhart. In 1931, John Nyhart wrote a book about Black Elk's legacy called Black Elk Speaks. John G. Neihart is uh, the Poet Laureate in Perpetuity of Nebraska, and he is the author um, most well known for Black Elk Speaks, but he's also published over 40 uh, works, and um, he, we have a museum and a state historic site here in Bancroft where he lived and worked for a time. And um, as for why he wrote Black Elk Speaks, um, the way I understand it is he was sent to write that book. Um, he was doing research for his epic poem, The Cycle of the West, which was a five-volume work that took him nearly 40 years to complete, or rather nearly 30 years to complete, and he was working on doing research about the ghost dance movement, and that led him to meet Black Elk, and Black Elk informed him that he was there to write that book, to. Um, save the vision for Black Elk. And so I really believe that's why he wrote it, because he was set to. John G. Neihardt's relationship with Black Elk is, I guess, what you would call a spiritual brotherhood. Um, they both spoke different languages. Um, Black Elk spoke Lakota, Neihardt spoke and wrote in English, but they could still understand each other um, through the interpreters, um, including Black Elk son Ben, um, and then Nyhart was also accompanied by his daughters on, um, and, a, and a son too on different journeys to Pine Ridge. So with the help of other people, they were able to create this book together. There was an unseen um, kind of force that brought Nyhart uh, together with Black Elk, and so Black Elk um, really didn't know Nyhart, but he understood that he was the one that was going to save his vision for all of mankind. And so that really, that is a leap of faith.